Hiya, and uh, welcome to Lawrence Isn't Writing. I'm Lawrence. Today I'm going to be talking about five books that are absolutely worth reading. All classics in their own way, and I try to get a nice cross-section of books from around the world. Alright, that's, that's really all there is to it. Intro. <music> That was the intro. Okay, uh, let's start off with a big one. Ulysses by James Joyce. You have absolutely heard of this book. It does not need an introduction. It is it's ridiculously big. It's about a thousand, about a thousand round figures pages. It is a difficult book. It's set up into 18 separate chapters, each more difficult to read than the last. Some of them are in what can only be described as made-up language. So why is it worth reading? One way you can approach it is from this perspective that it is a work of art that is demanding and if you give it your time and investment you will have you will have experienced something that very few people have actually managed to get all the way through. Other side of the fence, it's worthwhile reading because it's actually hiding quite a nice sweet little story about Leopold Bloom and his, his lonely self-deprecating life in Dublin and his relationship with his wife which is kind of strained and him reaching out to this young guy Stephen um, as kind of like a son slash peer um, and there is a sweet little familial story in there, which I found really <laughs> rewarding in its own right, the way it all sort of comes together by the end. So there's, yeah, as I said, I've rambled long enough for this one. There's two ways to enjoy it, both of which completely rewarding. That's Ulysses. What did I have next on the list? Oh, uh, just Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Again, you've heard of it, needs no introduction. It's, a, it's about an Air Force squadron um, off the coast of Italy um, and all of their misadventures. The thing that makes this one difficult, and yes it is difficult, is that it is written in this non-chronological, non-linear fashion, um, and it's circular in nature. So you all know what a catch-22 is. A catch-22 is basically a proposition that can't be achieved because it defeats itself. And the whole circular nature and the weird sort of logic behind that is the way that this whole book is written. So not gonna lie, the first 50 to 100 pages, you're gonna be like, what the fuck am I reading? I have no idea what I'm reading, it's weird. But there's some certain scenes that are repeated again and again and again, and you see them from other people's perspective and you get more information each time as they go. And that's when you start to realize what the book is actually about. It's about the, the absurdity and chaotic nature of war. And when you get past that you realize what's going on here and how it's written. It's actually really funny. Um, I mean, it's a comic novel more than anything, at least for the first like three quarters, and then shit gets dark towards the end. But either way, totally worth reading. It's really rewarding, it's brilliantly written, uh, and if you're a writer, this is a book that will make you feel fully inadequate. The way he must have constructed this book blows my mind. I have no idea how he's done it. I think he took either five or seven years to write this book and you could tell that they were well spent. Totally worthwhile reading. Am I selling any of these? Who knows? Virginia Woolf and Mrs. Dalloway. I've talked about this book before. I will talk about it again. Virginia Woolf is one of my heroes. I adore her and everything she's ever written. And this one is the one I keep coming back to. Um, it's her masterpiece. Knock at the door. Hi! Okay, we're back. Uh, Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway. Quick recap, it's a day in the life of Clarissa Dalloway as she goes around London setting up a party that she's going to have that night. Um, it is a book that is written in a stream of consciousness style and there are points where you're in a park, for example, and the narration jumps between random people in the park and through their heads and it's brilliant but it's very much just a book about a woman setting up a party on the surface when you dig below that it's about regret um and early 20th century oppression and this is pre-suffragette movement and beyond that there's also the fact that clarissa herself um, has had a love affair with a woman in the past and she's very regretful about not being able to continue on with that um, she's married to a man that she kind of has very mixed feelings about. But it's also just beautifully written. You don't even have to care for the plot 
the writing is schmeck. It is it's poetry. She could have been a poet. Not a doubt in my mind she would have been a great one. But if it counts for anything at all, this is the only book I have ever reread cover to cover. I'm gonna go to Victor Hugo, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You've heard of it, you know The Hunchback. Disney made a movie about of it, so you've definitely heard of it. Um, again, quite a big book, very readable, and definitely not what you think it is when you first pick it up. If you've seen the Disney film, uh, or you've heard of this book, you think it's just about Quasimodo, The Hunchback, um, and Esmeralda, who he falls in love with, um, living in Paris in, I guess, medieval Paris. I don't know when this is set, like the 15th, 16th century? Yeah, in the 1400s. Yeah, I mean, basically, it, it's about the hunchback um, falling in love with Esmeralda. Their relationship isn't the focus, even though all the films will lead you to believe that. Her experience being, you know, downtrodden and beaten over and beaten by the... Um, French society of the time is quite important. And there's a lot of side characters that are massively important to the plot of this book. You've probably seen much smaller versions of this. There definitely are abridged versions. I wouldn't recommend them. However, if you want to nip out literally like that much of the book, there is a huge section about a third of the way through where Victor Hugo literally just describes what Paris looked like at the time to give you an idea of what medieval Paris look like uh, before the restoration. And there's an adorable little white goat called Dijali who's a massive part of the plot and I was so worried about the whole time because you may not realize this but this is an incredibly violent book. I didn't know that going in. Fuck! It gets brutal towards the end. There's a bit and this may spoil or may not spoil. Either way, Quasimodo is blamed for crimes and the populace come to get him and he fucking massacres people. There's a bit where he's on the roof of Notre Dame and is like running around the rooftops throwing giant pots of melted scalding iron on people. Super violent, super interesting. The plot is great. It's, it's kind of like just an adventure story. All right, last but certainly not least, Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. It is a book about a guy who commits a murder because he thinks that he can philosophically justify it to himself. The guy's name is Raskolnikov. Uh, he murders a, a loan shark who he thinks is a horrible scourge on society. And he thinks that because he's ridding her and benefiting from it himself, because he's a great person and because he's going to be able to do a lot of good with the money he obtains for that, that he can justify it. The murder happens pretty early in the book. It goes comedically awry, but he manages to get away with it. And then the rest of the book is about him kind of eluding the authorities as long as he can. They describe it as a detective novel in reverse, as in you know the crime, you just don't know if they're going to get away with committing it. And that's 100% what it is. And there's this closing sense of dread as the book goes on. And there's a secondary component, which is how Raskolnikov feels about having committed the crime because as I've sort of built up to, he thinks he can justify it. But as the book bears on, you start to realize that no, he can't. And the weight of that starts to get on top of him. And, and honestly, this is some of the most, I think, accurate representation of, of anxiety and, and stress and traumatic stress um, that I've ever read. It's, it's a work of Russian literature, so when you hear that, you think of Tolstoy, and you think of Gogol, you think of the, these books that are massive and weighty and have like political undercurrents and like generational themes in them. This is a very simple story about a guy who commits a crime, tries to get away with it and realizes that even if he's getting away with it in a physical sense, in a psychological sense, he's not. And how he copes with that. There is a strong Christian undercurrent, he falls in love with a prostitute and confesses to her uh, and she encourages him to seek redemption in Christ. I won't spoil the ending, but it is great. So there you go. They are five classic books that are absolutely worth your time and investment. Subscribe to the channel if you like this sort of content. Uh, have an incredible, amazing, fantabulous week. That'll do. Yeah, that's it. We're done here. And I'll see you later.